So, without further ado, I will kick. Uh, I will uh, just read some bios for you guys, so that uh, we can all get acquainted a bit better. Alison Dunlop. That's Alison. Uh, has worked uh, at Cisco Canada on the corporate social responsibility team since 2003, and currently holds the position of project manager for Connected North. Connected North is an immersive virtual education and healthcare solution that helps address the needs of people living in remote and underserved Canadian communities by providing access to new and engaging resources. Carrie Ann. Carrie Ann is, oh, you're going to help me. Okay, so Carrie Ann is the. Oh, uh... oh no, I want to. I'll get to There you have it. Okay, thank you. Uh, da, 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 da. In Inlet Eagle Clan of the Old Masset. <laughs> I'll let her do that when she has the, has the mic. I, what do you say, Carrie Ann? I, I beg your pardon. Uh, she is the academic lead of the Hadagwai Higher Education Society and also teaches in its uh, semester programming and natural resource management. She also comes from a long line of Haida weavers and carries on the tradition as a weaver of the prestigious Raven's Tale and another word I cannot and will not attempt to pronounce effectively for the sake of my own dignity. Carlos is the executive director of the Haida Gwaii Higher Education Society, founded in 2008. HGHES is an enterprising nonprofit, uh, a nonprofit apl uh, applying approaches to education and development, offering uh, experiential education grounded in the people, communities, and ecosystems of this remote, resource rich archipelago. And that is probably one of the most fun sentences I've ever read in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> and last but certainly not least, we have uh, Sonia, Sonia Prohos. Pro oh, I'll get it. Yeah, okay, she'll get it. Uh, see, this is a panel on education. Uh, my education is coming to me on the spot. So, uh, is the VIP Education of Inspire, an Indigenous-led re uh, registered charity that invests in the education of Indigenous people for the long-term benefit of these individuals, their families and communities, and Canada. Prior to that, she served as director of uh, Point Douglas Revitalization Initiative for the Manitoba government. One of her key achievements in this role was leading the development of a model that ensures the best integration of service and educational outcomes, which is being pilot piloted in one of the uh, highest risk neighborhoods and schools in the country. Let's give them a warm round of applause, shall we? Okay. You're up? Okay, then I shall turn the floor over to Sonia. Okay, great. So I'm going to have to uh, gracefully try to get off this and uh, keep an eye on what I'm looking or what I'm showing you. So uh, first of all, I just I, I call no fairies five minutes really. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. So I'll be talking really, 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 really fast. <laughs> um, and I want to I want to um, sort of extend a, a thank you to McConnell to the organizers and and what a delight it is to be a part of a lovely panel that we have here um, I'm in good I'm in uh, good esteem and good company so this is inspire I'm going to do a quick what what we do and then we're going to get into a bit of a, a talk about innovation so you can see uh, we're we're for indigenous people by indigenous people we're trying to create change around education, um, recognizing that that's the new buffalo, that's the window of opportunity for our kids. <clears throat> we want to influence that through role models. We celebrate Indigenous achievers. Um, and we, we want to uh, really reach the lives and impact the lives of our community in meaningful ways. Uh, many of you will know us from um, our Inspire Awards or uh, the old Aboriginal Achievement Foundation. So there is another part of Inspire that is all education focused. And I, I can only, I, I can sort of talk very, I could talk at length about the need for mentorship, why it's important to see ourselves reflected in positive ways like the Inspire Awards, but it seems pretty self-explanatory. And since I have five minutes, <laughs> we're going into the Inspire Institute. So, uh, in 2003, we did a national consultation. During that time, uh, we discovered many things that need to be as presented as focus, and one of them was the K-12 uh, area. So we developed the Institute, which uh, is really like a virtual resource center. 
Um, it's online and it deals with K-12 issues. On that you can see resources, webinars, lesson plans, models, strategies, frameworks, legislation, all kinds of stuff that is creating meaningful change in increasing academic outcomes for our kids. So that's the Institute. If you go on our webpage, you, you run right into it. Within the Institute, we have three types of projects. We have successful practices. Now, I'm not sure if I can do this. If, can I go backwards and forwards on this thing? Let's, let's see if I can go backwards. I'll know in a second. Yes, I can. OK. I'm a little challenged, so we're going to start with successful practices. Successful practices are practices that are increasing academic outcomes that have been evaluated and are working. So we have communities that say, we're doing something innovative. We're creating that. And, and if, look, we have this great evaluation that proves it, but nobody knows about it. So we send in scholars, indigenous scholars, to panel the evaluation, take a look at it, legitimize it. If it's a successful practice, we post it nationally and try to give it traction. And share it, because we know lots of people need to be trying these innovations. OK, I'm going to go back. Nurturing capacity projects are very similar, uh, except they haven't been evaluated. So we'll have people that will say, like communities that will say, we're doing this amazing thing, but we don't have the time, energy, money, expertise, whatever, to do the evaluation. We'll send in an Indigenous scholar, and if we can find one in the community, a master's student to work with them, they'll work with the school that's often a school, but it can be a community organization like CETA or um, Pathways or you know, a, an organization that's engaged with, around education. And uh, we'll teach them how to collect the data, how to do the evaluation, some of the methodology, and then we'll do the full evaluation for them. And if it's a successful practice, it'll gain traction. You can see right here, we have 35 of these projects going on across the country. McConnell funds partially some of this stuff. And they're in all of those provinces. So one, two, three, four, five, six, I mean, a whole bunch of provinces here. <laughs> Um, and there's some of the nurturing capacity projects in happening in Winnipeg, Children of the Earth High School, like there's, there's a number of, um, Seven Oaks School Division has some, uh, Wichiwakanuk we, we did one, um, so there's a, num there's a number happening in Winnipeg here. Uh, there, these ones I have to stop and just say there's real street credit that comes from these, there's real traction that comes from these. One of them, for instance, we just had our national gathering on Indigenous education last week. We had some of these nurturing capacity projects present. One of them, uh, since the nurturing capacity, Pamela Sparkling Eyes, uh, the graduation coach out of Edmonton project, she has had 21 requests to speak, won an international award, um, and uh, started that graduation coach model in six other provinces. So often getting that level of evaluation and that level of um, support and piloting across the country, information sharing across the country, really brings out some, some traction for, for those programs. And the last one I want to talk about within a row, within this sort of context, is realizing projects. These are projects where a community will say to us, we've tried A, B, C, and D. It's not working. We really are concerned about our educational outcomes. I don't know what I did there. And um, we need some help. Would you mind helping us put together a plan? So we'll go into a community, and uh, you know, whether it's an urban center or a reserve community, and we'll do a huge consultation, and then develop a longer-term plan. It's usually more of an integrated service delivery approach, these plans are. And a good example is up in Cadet Lake in Peace River. We have a realizing project going on right now. We're, st we're trying to get some traction on one in Winnipeg, and we have one in Saskatchewan, and we have another one percolating in uh, Quebec. And So they're kind of in different areas of the country. Um, Peace River, they, they named engagement. Um, a professional development, policy, safety as the four main issues. So we're starting a radio, the plan then turned into, we're starting a radio station for the senior years, we're starting an early years engagement initiative for the younger kids. We're, um, we're working with Cisco to do some uh, professional development webinars, plus we do our own. We sent all of the teachers to the National Gathering Conference. We're doing some um, engagement planning um, programming with the, the parents. Um, in the community. We've gotten IBM to do a full IT audit of the entire school and the teacherages. It's a reserve community. 
Um, we're putting in uh, $160,000 worth of new IT in the school um, and new phone systems and a whole new security system. The RCMP came in and did a security audit. We're putting a new security system. So it's, and then we're bringing in mental health and um, addiction support. So it's a, it's a holistic integrated approach. And the best way to describe it is it's meant to hit a saturation point that tips the balance. So those are realizing projects. Okay, all of that is just so very innovative, right? <laughs> Then, then we are looking at peer support, which is um, an educator mentorship program. The difference between that and other mentorship programs for, for teachers across, is that this is national, so you can connect across the country. This is the year that we hit a tipping point with this, and we are getting absolutely huge traction on, on, um, on the peer support program now. Um, just uh, amazing, amazing, amazing outcomes. And I think part of the, the benefit of having a national program is it doesn't have to be within your school division or your school, and you're not limited to your local area, um, and you can really make matches based on particular unique needs, right? We, I just talked about the National Gathering. We just had it. It's the most wonderful conference, honestly. And uh, we have soaring youth career conferences. Uh, rather than going, it's not like a really, it's kind of like an Aboriginal We Day with, uh, you know, bent on careers and education. Um, they're run by and for uh, youth, by senior youth, lots of mentorship, and very, very innovative conferences. If you go on our YouTube and go, if you go into YouTube, press in, uh, type in Inspire, and then type in Soaring, S-O-A-R-I-N-G, you'll see these neat conferences in action. They're really neat. We do about three a year. Industry in the classroom is some of uh, it's the modules that we take into the classroom. These are very, um, there's, there's a high uptake when, and, and a real engagement in the classroom when, when we present, and we try to get sort of Aboriginal, rock star-ish kind of people that are famous to, to connect with the students and, and learn about other industries that you, know, you just don't know about, right? Um, and they're often in various sectors or sections, um, areas in the country. Of course, this is our Building Brighter Futures program. Uh, we've given away 79 million. With Building Brighter Futures is bursary and scholarships. And last year, we gave away 14 million. Um, and we're certainly hopeful to do the same. The number of requests we got last year was 7,134. We were able to award 4,921. Um, the amounts that we had to come in for requests were 90 million, uh, and we were able to award 14 of that. So we met 16%. This is, this is um, I know this is fast, this is the change, this is, this is an interesting slide, I like this slide. You can see 261 awards in 2013-14 went to education, 533 went the following year. Engineering, 73 went up to 138. So pretty well every sector, indigenous people are getting educated. And I often say it's our rightful time and our rightful place to take our rightful responsibility and here it is, eh? Um, Rivers to Success is a lovely program. It moves kids from post-secondary education into the workplace with a mentorship model. So we're doing all kinds of things. Of course, this is the Inspire Awards that are happening in February in Vancouver. And I wanted to point out Elder May Louise Campbell is getting honored this year, which is lovely. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And okay, so this is the, this is the innovation part. I tried to talk fast, sorry. So, this is where I see, if I could, if I could be so bold, where I think there's great innovation. We need to have greater integration, right? We need demographic representation, let's be honest. I think that needs to happen at a colossal level. Because you can have all the mentorship programs in the world, but if you have Aboriginal people in normal places in society mentoring to other people, it's a pretty natural mentorship, right? We need, obviously, more culturally appropriate curriculum. And, and to speak to that, we're doing, uh, we're doing a truth and reconciliation workshop for uh, one, three, and five days to teach or to train educators. And we're looking at piloting it here in Winnipeg, actually. We need continued uh, development and integrated service delivery supports, allowing our services to work differently and better, not harder. And uh, so, it's about partnerships 
not duplicating. Um, it's about thinking outside of boxes and de-siloing. We need uh, funding, obviously, to, to talk about student supports. And one of, and one of the innovative sort of uh, discussions that are, are going on right now are through the Canada Learning Bond Partnerships. And Inspire is considering and working with the group of, of um, like-minded uh, folks uh, that, that are, are looking at having learning bonds as a foundation for kids. Because we know through studies that if, if our students know that financially they have an option, um, they have a higher percentage or propensity to, to succeed. And, and if they knew that in grade, in, in, in grade one, just like if they knew that in grade six or in grade nine, and all the way through, then you know that th that's not going to be the barrier that it currently is. I didn't, I didn't put this slide on, but this is a really important point to this. Our grad survey last year, we did a grad survey, and we dug in 40, 42% was our, our um, feedback rate, which was a very high percentage. And it went back 20 years, I think. So we found kids, a lot of kids, that we have funded over the last 20 years. And what we learned was 93% of those kids graduated university. So what does that tell us? That tells us that 93%, and we only, we only fund Indigenous kids, right? We're an Aboriginal organization working with our community. But that tells us if you fund them, they'll make it. So funding cannot be underestimated. Uh, regulation around bandwidth, I had to throw this in here because we're just, everywhere we go in the north, if you don't have bandwidth, we can't provide the level of service that we want to provide for you. And a greater focus on national education research to help us bring solution to the table. And I think we all need to be compiling our research. And we're talking about doing that at Inspire at a more national level. So thanks so much. And I'll stop now. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> oh, that was really loud. Um, I'm going to follow Sonia's lead and actually stand over here as well. Thank you all so much for your time. I, I'd like to acknowledge it's a real privilege to be here on Treaty 1 uh, territory and a privilege to be with all of you today and to be on this amazing panel. So thank you all. And I'll, I'll stick to my five minutes, I hope, so I'm going to talk really fast and ask me questions after, please. So. I'm here uh, in my capacity as a corporate in a cor the corporate affairs team at Cisco Canada, and we work on this amazing project called Connected North. And so what is Connected North? Connected North was born out of an idea that my boss, Willa Black, had when she had a meeting with Mary Simon, who was then the leader of ITK Inuit Tapri Kanatami. And Mary came to Willa and said, we have a problem in education. Not enough students are graduating. We can't keep our students engaged. What can you do? So Willow was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> okay, and she brought it back to the team, and together we were like, oh, well, we're not educators, you know, we're not youth, none of us are young anymore, unfortunately, um, but you know what, we're really good at this darn thing called the internet, and we're really good at technology, and can we bring some of our skill set and, and help address this issue? So that's how Connected North started, and behind me here is um, our, our pilot school, this is where our journey began in Iqaluit, the Exarni Middle School. And uh, we're so grateful for them for uh, leading the way with us. So what is Connected North? It's a leading edge program that uh, provides immersive and interactive education and healthcare resources over two-way high definition video. The most important thing about this is it's two-way. It's collaborative. It's people speaking on both sides of the, of the dialogue. And it's fantastic to be able to do this. And it's high definition. It's, it's not pausing and freezing. We work with bandwidth providers. As Sonia said, bandwidth is a huge challenge. And we work with bandwidth providers to make it possible. So it's a very high quality of service. Um, and we can't do this alone. We work at the amazing partnership, and I think that's a big part of our innovation, is that we realize this is not something Cisco can do alone. We bring in amazing not-for-profits and bandwidth providers and corporations and foundations and Cisco customers and partners to all get engaged behind this issue. So Connected North, we have two main areas that we work in. Uh, we work in healthcare and education. The healthcare piece I won't really focus on today because uh, we're talking about education innovation, but we do work in youth telepsychiatry. Um, which is fantastic with the Hospital for Sick Children, the government of Nunavut, um, and their, their Ministry of, of Health and Mental Health and Addiction. And uh, we're now the sole provider of interactive tele youth telepsychiatry for, for those in need in Nunavut, which is amazing. 
Uh, on the education side, we work both in kindergarten to grade 12, uh, and we do four main things. We do experts in the classroom. A very important thing to, to point out for all of this is our content is driven by the teachers and students. At Cisco, we don't decide the content. We go to the teachers and students and say, you know, we'll facilitate the technology, we'll make it work. You guys pick what you want to hear. You guys pick who you want to hear from, and, and we'll, we'll make it happen for you. So we have experts in the classroom. We have scientists and artists and uh, astronauts coming in and speaking to the students about their curriculum, about their life, which is amazing. We then do cultural exchange. We match classrooms across Canada so they can work on group projects together and speak to each other. They share their cultures and their values. They just had an amazing project with a school in the Northwest Territories and a school just outside of Calgary on climate change in my backyard. You know, what does it look like to me? And students presented to each other and it was really a unique experience. Uh, we do capacity building for teachers. Sonia talked about this really briefly. Um, we're trying to give teachers, especially in remote areas, the ability to, to do the training that would otherwise not really be accessible to them and develop their careers and have the questions answered that they want answered. And then we're getting into virtual career fairs, uh, bringing both Indigenous and non-Indigenous mentors into the classroom virtually to speak to students about, you know, what else can you do and what are the options out there and try to inspire some, some hope is a, a big thing that is a word that's come back to a lot. And then we also work at the college and university level. Um, this is the networking academy. It's a Cisco thing we run around the world. We teach um, college and university level students about networking, how to build and maintain computer networks. And we started our first one um, in Nunavut Arctic College, and it started about two years ago, and we're having great traction with that, and we're hopefully opening one in northern Ontario uh, next year. So like I said, we work with many partners. Here's a slide with just a few of them. None of this could be possible without them. And, uh, and we're very grateful for everyone who's come to the table with either you know, funding to make sure that the program is free for students and schools or for, with amazing content, pro bono content. So we're very lucky. Uh, this is where we're operating across Canada right now. Like I said, we started in one school in the fall of 2013, and we have expanded to 15 schools across Canada, and they're growing every day. We, um, I, we speak at conferences like this, and people come up to me, and that's sort of very organically how it happens. And we're very excited to be able to expand that way, and we work with service providers to make sure the quality is there. Um, and I'm just going to leave you with a quote from Dr. Jordans from the Advanced Learning Technologies Lab at the University of Toronto. They're doing an independent academic um, evaluation of the program. And I really like that he said that the current participants are eager to remain a part of the program and more anxious to join it. Thus, there's an interest, actually a passion, to keep Connected North um, going and to maximize their potential to provide deep, connected 21st century learning. So it's very exciting to be a part of this. Um, so now I'm going to stop talking. I want to bring the program to life to you, so I brought some short clips of what it actually looks like so you can see it for yourself. Um, I am going to tell you, I put the clips together and I am not a movie editor. We're working on a proper clip that actually the RVAT Film Society, uh, the students are going to do for us. But this is sort of the best I could do with what I had, so I apologize. But I hope it gives you a sense of, of what we bring to life. Until we get the sound going, I'll do a little narration. Um, so this is a, a guitar expert in Toronto teaching a group of oh, there we go, teaching a group of students in Cape Dorset. For my last note of my melody, and so it sounds like this when you put it all together. So pinky on, pinky off, and then middle finger off. Udako, Your Excellency, what have you found to be the best way to engage and enhance students in their love of learning? I would say to maintain the passion that is there at birth. Uh, all of us who've had the, the joy of having children know that children, as soon as they begin to get a little past mama or dada, uh, are always asking why. We eat whale in the Arctic. Whale in Inuit is mata. Mama. Mama. <laughs> Whale we eat is a narwhal and the 
Have any of you ever tried any whale before? No. 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 Our errand was o over, but Vashti sat glued to her chair. Her paper was empty. Do you have empty paper in front of you now? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Vashti's teacher leaned over the paper. Ah, a polar bear in a snowstorm, she said. Very funny, said Vashti. I just can't draw. This last one's a little uh, graphic because it's biology, but it's very cool. Look at this heart, guys, <laughs> compared to the normal size heart. Oh, oh, wow. This is classic, guys, for a diseased heart that you characteristically see in failure. It becomes massively enlarged, guys, and it, it can't meet the demands of the body. It gets weaker as it gets bigger. And unfortunately, guys, let me issue a warning to you. Okay, there isn't a drug in the world, there isn't a doctor in the world that can reverse this process once it goes too far. So that's just a brief summary of Connected North. So, hello, I'm a... Uh... I'm, I'm, I am on. Uh, I'm Carlos Ormond, uh, again, the Executive Director of the Haida Gwaii Higher Education Society. Um, I'd like to say hawa uh, for this opportunity to be presenting to you, but uh, also thankful for here to be visiting the, uh, the territory of uh, Treaty 1 and also the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, uh, I'd like to, well, I'm, I am not Haida. I'm not from Haida um, ancestry, um, but uh, uh, I have been connected uh, to the Haida people um, and the Haida Nation for for about 30 years, um, and some of you may remember um, uh, the Lyle Island uh, Tlai Gwai uh, standoff, uh, where uh, many of us saw eld Haida elders uh, creating a, a, um, a, a blockade, stopping the logging of, uh, of this island. Um, uh, that affected me when I was, when I was a young child, um, but uh, what, we, what you also saw there is, um, is that you, you, not only did you see the Haida elders there, but you also saw uh, an example of a, a cross-cultural movement. Um, it was not only Haida, but it was also those that did not come from Haida ancestry that were there. Um, fast forward uh, 30 years, uh, some of those same people that were there um, at, the, uh, at the blockade uh, came together again to deal with another, another issue on the islands, and that was um, uh, uh, the kind of shift um, loss of uh, jobs uh, in the natural resource uh, sector, f uh, fisheries and in and forestry, um, but also seeing uh, their youth uh, leaving. Um, so they came together looking at the, the social innovations that they had had, um, looking at the example of the, uh, the Guayanas, uh, creation of the Guayanas Park, um, and uh, came, to get, came together and what, what, their, what could they do with, the, with, this, with their examples there. And uh, what, they, uh, what they, they thought was that, well, why don't we put together a, uh, a, a program here, work with uh, some universities and create a program here based on the community and, uh, and uh, the, the people and the land and the sea of Haida Gwaii. Um, we've now, uh, it's now, we've now been around since 2008. We've now had uh, 10 semesters, um, over, I think over 100, 150 students. Um, and uh, we, uh, our programs uh, bring uh, close to half a million dollars uh, into the communities, into the communities of Haida Gwaii, specifically uh, Queen, Sh Queen Charlotte and Skidigat, um, and we're also looking to expand. Um, um, I'll, pass that inf I'll pass this off to Carrie Ann to, to speak about the programs. Diu Hadagan, Kinawas, Hinudi Kiang, Gatsage Gu Studi Kolagan, Masset Studi Ijung, Kaju Hinu Audi Ijung, Ilskalas Hinu Nan Ijung. So my name, um, my head name is Kinawas. I come from the Algitans, Masset in the Eagle Clan, and my mother is Evelyn Vanderhoop uh, Kajuth, and my uh, nani, my grandmother, is uh, Dolores Churchill Ilskalas. Um, I come from a family of weavers, and I'm the academic lead at the Haida Gwaii Higher Education Society. Um, 
Our programs are very place-based and um, we work with the, a lot of the community members who come in as uh, local educators and experts. Um, we have uh, offer a fall semester in natural resource sciences um, of which Dan McCarthy is one of our instructors. We're actually in the midst of um, a semester right now and we're taking the time out to be here with you and I'm really grateful and honored to be here um, and be on Treaty 1 territory um, and be able to speak about our programs. Um, and we have a winter semester in uh, natural resource um, studies which is more social science based. And so building on uh, what we have um, have been successful at. Um, we bring 21 students from universities all across Canada to come and study on Haida Gwaii and um, learn in this experiential uh, program. And uh, we've had about 10% of our students have been local students from Haida Gwaii and we're always you know, really trying to um, increase that number of students. And um, they come and they spend four months and they, um, we have block course models and they're mostly people in the environmental sciences and we're really excited um, that coming next academic year, starting January 2017, we'll be offering a semester in reconciliation studies and that's um, brand new for us. We started that journey uh, this past spring um, with an advisory uh, um, meeting uh, where we brought together people from industry, government, local people, people that have been working with our programs and are, have been partnering with our society for a long time. And um, we went on this uh, great journey to um, develop this new semester. And um, one of the amazing things about this semester in reconciliation studies is because of the development process, um, I really feel like it was a reconciliation in action. We had the opportunity to um, we put a call out for letters of interest of people who may want to be part of developing this, the syllabus for these courses that we had uh, decided on in our, in our um, advisory meeting. And we were um, just so excited that we had so much local interest. So we, have just, we decided on a process where we um, included, um, for each course that was developed, we worked with uh, you know, somebody that was um, Haida or local First Nations and then paired them up with somebody that was um, from a heritage other than indigenous to Canada. And so they worked on the, um, the syllabus in a very kind of collaborative way. And so we've come up with this um, program. And our, all of our programs are accredited through uh, the University of British Columbia. Um, and uh, we're just you know, so excited that we continue to, to kind of expand our programming. And uh, like Carlos said, our current semesters are offered in the north, or the south end of Haida Gwaii and the communities of um, Queen Charlotte and Skidigit. And we're based in the Kailangay um, Haida, uh, Haida Gwaii Museum. And uh, with this new semester in reconciliation, we're going to be moving into the north end, into the Masset and Old Masset um, villages where, where my family comes from. So we're really excited to be expanding there, and it's our hope that um, in the future we'll be moving out to the other communities on Haida Gwaii as well. So, yeah. Hi, everybody. I would like to thank our panelists for your presentations, and um, we have about 15 minutes, I think. And so, sorry, Tina. I'll say this: it's two here, and I was thinking maybe it, two there. Yeah, two. It might be. It might be if to maybe open it up to the audience first. Yes, I was just going to say perfect, that. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. He is like right on it. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that. Yeah, let's like let's do. Um, I know that says two minutes, but it's if we go till three, if you guys are fine with that, then we could go 17 minutes. So let's go to um, any questions. And I can bring the mic to you. Yes. Hi, my name is Brittany, and I am Dene from Fort Chippewan. And I don't have a question, but I would just like to share with all of you that I am a second year university student, and Inspire has supported me financially. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to um, maybe share like a little bit of your story? Like what is it that you wanted to do and what journey do you feel like you're on? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, right now I am studying at Briarcrest College and Seminary. I'm in a Bachelor of Arts program in Biblical Studies and Inspire has helped me because uh, right now it, it helps fund me for school. Um, and 
the, the work that I'm interested in is working with youth and um, really helping them see how much the Lord loves them uh, and how much that they can do as well. And um, right now with with a lot of that work, it, it isn't financially um, very supportive in that. And so uh, Inspire has helped me with school so that I am free to be able to work for smaller wages and be able to support youth that way. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is, um, I really wanted to hear your voice because I was thinking about the impacts of the work that you do. You know, you, you told us about your programs and I was really interested in hearing about the impacts. And so maybe we can share a bit of that if we don't have a lot of questions. But if you have questions, here we go. Anybody? Yes. Hi, Michael, at the back there. Michael Champagne is a well-known deeply respected activist in our community. Thanks, Tina. Um, hello. Uh, great panel, uh, great information. Thank you all for what you've uh, presented here today. Um, uh, my question is specific to Sonia, but if others feel like they'd like to jump in, please don't, don't stop yourselves. Um, you, you touched very briefly on the role of mentorship, and I wanted to ask um, if there are things that Inspire uh, is up to nowadays that um, you could expand a little bit more on in terms of uh, how they role model as an organization in terms of encouraging others uh, to mentor uh, from an organizational perspective, but also from individuals' perspectives as well as, Sonia, you are one of my role models um, all the way from back in 2005 when you dragged me into this very room to give one of my very first public speaks to United Way of Winnipeg. And I want to thank you publicly for being one of my role models and also uh, ask about what... Uh, Inspire is up to nowadays to ensure that that type of mentorship continues. What a sweetheart, eh? Miigwech. Um, well, I mean, I think we would all in this room agree that mentorship is critical. And, uh, and I go back to, I remember, I remember the first time I saw the Aboriginal Achievement Awards on TV, saying to my dad, look, dad, look, look, what's that? what is that, right? <laughs> what, what is this? What is this thing where we're not, you know, on TV being dragged away in police cars? What is this thing that is re-envisioning us differently, right? And I, so I think that mentorship is a societal thing, and it's also an individual thing, and you correct you're correct, Michael, in saying that it's, it's an organizational piece. There's, a, there's an organizational piece to it. So, well, aside from our mentoring programs, and I'm, I'm, I deeply believe that um, being an educator is one of the toughest jobs I ever had. And uh, if for all the educators in this room, um, you do sacred work, and you should be acknowledged for that. It is, um, it, you know, you're, you're on, you're up, you have to be energized, and it is absolutely a vocation, not a job, right? Um, so those educators, often our teachers, are up in northern communities. Many of them are non-Indigenous, but we recognize that they'll be the ones that have the greatest impact on our kids. So if we don't provide a mentorship program for these guys, who's going to, right? I mean, and the retention rates in northern communities or in very, very remote communities are dismal, like dismal. So often you'll have teachers coming into northern communities. If they're from the community, there's a, there's a chance of retention, right? But often if they're not, it's a very special person that, uh, that can stay up and work and, and ends up staying up in, in some of those more isolated areas. And frankly, by, by Christmas, many, many uh, communities are, are down staff. So this is a very r real problem and it has a very real impact on our kids. Our kids that are some of the most gifted and talented that we know. Our kids that can and should be coming leaders of tomorrow, but unfortunately aren't graduating because there isn't any teachers in their community. Like that kind of stuff. So, so I mean, when we talk about the need for educator mentorship, uh, when we were looking at the options, what are the options? If they're not local, then what can we do? And that's where the peer, peer support program started. And it, the, I mean, at our national gathering, we had two peer support uh, and mentor and mentee come up and talk about the impact that this relationship that they had on them uh, was in front of the 700 teachers that showed up at this event. And I mean, you could have dropped, you could have heard a pin drop. Like it was, it was the most captivating, and it really, it really spoke to me of uh, 
what we all know. As a child, what do you need? All the stats tell you. I mean, there's lots of things you need as a child, but one thing you need is someone to believe in you. One thing you need going all the way up is someone to walk with you, right? And, that, and, and, and if, we, if we extrapolate from that, we know that mentorship is important not just for the six-year-old, not just for the 18-year-old, but for many of us throughout our lives at different times in our lives. So, um, you know, speaking to mentorship, whether it's educator mentorship or the Rivers program that mentors people in tool and die or people in all kinds of different types of, of fields, business, um, you know, social work, you name it, right? These are all paths, they're all walking paths in our lives and, and none of us walk alone and it's no fun to walk alone. So, I mean, I'm sort of stating the obvious on that one. In terms of organizational mentorship, I think we recognize that we're a larger one and uh, I often get asked by smaller organizations, will you help me do this? Or can we move, we want to we go over here, will, will, you know, can you give me some advice or partnership or who should I turn to? And I think that all of us as former CEOs, EDs, leadership positions, yourself, Michael, are a mentor to many people, I'm sure. Um, so we all carry that um, burden of responsibility and uh, the joy of those relationships. Thanks for the question. Do we have anybody else who wants to add to that? just heard recently a quote that made me, it resonated with me, and it's, they said, um, I can't remember who it was, it's going to kill me, but uh, they said, it's hard to be what you can't see. Oh, totally, love that, love that. And it's, yeah. I find, you know, it's, it's, it's presented itself throughout this conference, throughout this week, and I think, you know, touching on, on your work, it's, it's very true, and I think mentorship is a big part of that. Okay, so um, we have one, one question here, and then Sean actually wants to ask a question, too, our uh, camera operator. So we'll take these last two questions. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to say that I uh, support, I believe, in all of what has just been said about mentorship. Um, I was in a First Nation community uh, about a year ago, and we were talking to a group of students in high school, and we were asking them, what would matter most to you? And one young man said, encouragement, right. encouragement. And, the way, and it wasn't just that he said encouragement, it was a way he said it. And, um, and, and other people were saying other things that were important, but that really struck me uh, because of the way he said it. So, but my question is this, um, should we not be providing or talking more about uh, tutoring? Should we not, particularly in the formal school system, um, put a greater emphasis on helping do all that mentoring that we're talking about in and out of school because it's essential. But once that we, but in conjunction with that, at the same time, be putting more emphasis on helping kids um, achieve academically, which means providing tutoring and 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 just do more of both, or, or at least more of tutoring and not less of mentoring. But but I'm wondering how, how, if you have any thoughts about that. Thank you, Gerald Farthing. I'll say that uh, that's been an, uh, uh, an issue that's been brought up in our community uh, with regards to pre uh, preparing uh, some of the Haida youth to go to, go to universities as they, they leave their, their family and their community um, and, they, and they, they're, not able, they're not able to finish off their first year and then they come back. And so, yeah, it's, it's something that's... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we've had experience similar to what, sort of what you've said and completely in the tutoring vein. As I said initially, the content we provide over the technology is all driven by the community and, and by the schools and the, and the students. And one school in particular that we work with had a group of grade 12 math students and they approached us and they said, what I really want is, can someone give us some extra help in math over lunch a couple days yeah. a week? Yeah. And so what we do is we have this amazing expert from the University, uh, Queen's University in Kingston, and he just dials up the bridge and answers their questions, and he has you know, a pen and a paper and goes through math problems with them on break. And, and, and this is just one, one example. And, and we're sort of getting into that. We're, we're still very new. We're in our third school year. But it's stuff like this that is student-led uh, that we're responding to, and I think it's very much in, in that vein that tutoring is, is an important part of the puzzle as well. Every, every single one of our realizing projects has a tutoring component. I didn't mention that. There's a lot of components, right? But, uh, but um, that, that tutoring component can uh, usually is connected right after or during or interim in the school day. Because uh, lots of the, the First Nations communities that we would be working with, kids get bussed. Yeah. 
So the after school piece is a limitation, right? Mm -hmm. But there's two pieces that the tutoring is, has proven to be most effective. Um, a, uh, in, within the classroom, and I was actually going to talk to you about <laughs> tutoring on a, on a longer range All right. uh, <laughs> IT level. But connections, making connections. I know it. <laughs> but the other, the other is engagement with parents and tutoring. Where tutoring falls short is if, when it just becomes like hangout time. Yeah. And uh, so for tutoring to be really, it's just like um, drop-in centers are not as effective as actual active programming. Um, tutoring falls in, I mean, from just from studies, but that's pretty practical and we can all see that in action, right? But no, it's a really good point, Gerald. I just want to add, and I'm sure that you all, and I'm taking Sean's time, but I just want to quickly add that there's a lot of, like, courses that are not available for students either in distant or remote programming, right? So they don't, they don't have the right requirements right. to get into um, schools, post-secondary But places like too. Athabasca University and those online universities now are really being are so helpful in filling the gap for some of our northern communities. Like it's really helpful, eh? Excellent. Anyways. Thank you. And here we go with Sean. <laughs> Hi, Sean Peranto here, uh, Strongfront TV. I just want to say Inspire has inspired me over the years as well. Um, I was actually one of the original studio crew members at APTN. Awesome. And um, I'm a graduate of the Aboriginal Broadcast Training Initiative, first course of its kind Woo. in Canada. Yeah. And I'm a role model for my community. And I would love to connect with you for Connect North as well. I've wanted yeah, to go yeah, to yeah. Erviat and uh, teach filmmaking as well. Really? But uh, we couldn't get some funding through the people that I was connected with, so maybe we can connect too. Let's connect. But back to Inspire, <laughs> um, I was actually on the uh, NAF crew for seven out of the last 15 years and traveled and uh, was a live action cameraman and handheld. And um, they put me on handheld on my first show, and it really actually inspired me to... Um, yeah. It opened a lot of doors for me creatively as a filmmaker and starting right out in the business. And uh, you guys do wonderful things. Awesome. Um, you guys honored my cousin Ovid oh. Mercury, and uh, oh, you're I've Ovid's got to right yeah, some of relation of Ovid Mercury. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I really enjoy what Inspire yeah. does. It inspires so many people. Yeah. It uh, gave me a lot of confidence to do what I do. Yeah. Uh, this is my gift in life. Yeah. Um, I'm a continuation of our ancestors who were storytellers, and oh. I'm just a modern version of that. I just got chills. And yes, <laughs> and uh, that is what I do best and what our communities need the most. Yeah. And I'm proud to stay strong. Front's been to 95% of First Nation communities in the province. 500 video projects completed to date, and over 300 active clients. We're known for our professionalism, working well with elders and children, and respecting all custom culture and tradition. So um, thank you for being champions for our community. Thank you for inspiring me. I met uh, Tina on one of the shows, and uh, I've known her for many years, and yeah, she's a yeah. huge role model, and continue doing what you guys do, and I hope I can connect as well somehow sure, to sure. the north. I'd like to go further up yeah, north. Yeah. And, totally, uh, totally. I've been to Inuvik and Clavik, but uh, maybe uh, we can connect and get me yeah. up there sometime. Yeah, yeah. Miigwech, yeah. miigwech, yeah. Miigwech, thank you so much to our panelists, and I want to thank our participants. And um, what a fantastic, what a fantastic panel. It's very exciting, and um, I'm sure that we can connect, um, any of us, on any of this. If you have any further questions, this was really dynamic. Thank you.